Well, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to greet you as we gather for our time together. I'm Clay Brown, the pastor for adult discipleship here at Memorial Drive Presbyterian. If you've met me before, then aren't you the lucky ones? No, wait. Well, if you haven't met me, I encourage you to come up and talk with me briefly after our time together. Uh, it's a privilege to be part of this marvelous study, Word and Worship, uh, and particularly Deuteronomy. So let's begin our time with prayer and we'll get going. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and the comfort of your holy word we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. All right. Uh, we are looking at Deuteronomy 24 and 25. And I admit the first thought I had as I was preparing today's study was many thanks for not assigning me Deuteronomy 23. <laughs> you know, I had the kill them all chapter back in Deuteronomy 13. And so I get a little nervous, a little apprehensive about such things. And there are just so many uncomfortable references in Deuteronomy 23 doesn't seem like the ancient Israelites will, were all that bothered by references to body parts and bodily functions. And then I read Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, and wondered if my optimism was a little bit premature. And then I read Deuteronomy 25 and discovered I had not evaded trouble, only postponed it. But I will say, after digging into these two chapters a bit, my fears are largely relieved. Uh, chapter 24 is titled by the scholar and writer Christopher J.H. Wright in his commentary Deuter on Deuteronomy, which I've used a lot in this series. He calls it Community Laws, Portrait of a Caring Society. And that's with its emphasis, this chapter 24, on protecting the woman in a divorce proceeding, a prohibition of human trafficking, and a lot about the most vulnerable, the working poor, day laborers, foreigners, orphans, widows. And chapter 25 continues in this vein with a focus on just punishments, family continuity, and fairness in business practices. And so here are two chapters in Deuteronomy that I think focus on how to help those most often in need of help. Now, we don't often consider the ancient Israelites all that compassionate, do we? Uh, of course, we make that judgment in large measure due to our chronological snobbery, uh, the belief that we are so much better in so many ways than all ancient peoples. Now, I admit I like indoor plumbing, for example, and we have that far above the ancient Israelites, as last week's chapter so aptly noted. Uh, but in other areas, not a lot has changed, has it? Now, you also need to know I'm an outline person when it comes to studying and making sense of Scripture. It helps me put things in proper relationships when I read. But outlining Deuteronomy 24 and 25 calls to mind a famous quote. It's from Ralph Waldo Emerson, one of the giants of uh, American thought and literature. He says this, A foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds, adored by little statesmen and philosophers and divines. I'll ignore Emerson's jab at ministers for a moment. It's his detailing of foolish consistency that strikes home with me. You know, a foolish consistency is often what I want when I'm outlining. Uh, 
Uh, I want the patterns that make sense to me rather than the patterns that the, the passage, the text show, and the patterns that are present. The ancient Israelites didn't think at all like 21st century Presbyterians. I know that's a shock for us, but let's take that shock. Their need for structure in some areas, uh, like written documents, was different from what we believe we need. But I want chapters 24 and 25 to be easily outlinable, and they're not. Uh, like chapter 24, I'd, I would put verse 6 down to where all the other verses about how you don't take advantage of the poor are. I'm not sure where I'd put verse 7 about kidnapping a fellow Israelite and putting them into slavery. And not sure where I'd put verse 16 about parents and children being legally responsible for their own sins and not the sins of the other parties. Chapter 25 is actually a little easier, although that's only in a relative sense. But I still think an outline more as a flow chart uh, is helpful. So let's go with this today. Here's how I've outlined this passage. And each section begins with the word compassion. Because I think compassion is the theme that we're dealing with in these two chapters. First, uh, 24, 1 through 5, and then 7 through 9. Compassion for those in dire circumstances, like divorce, human trafficking, being afflicted with a leprous disease. My next section is 2416, compassion in legal relationships between parents and children. And then 246, skipping to 10 through 15, and then skipping again going from 17 to 22, compassion for the working poor and for foreigners, orphans, and widows. Then we get into chapter 25, and it's a little more straightforward. Verses 1 through 4 in 25, compassion for those undergoing punishments mandated by just proceedings, as well as a little side note about compassionately treating your working animals. And then verses 5 through 12 in chapter 25, compassion for families that because of death are unable to continue the family line and how to remedy it. And then we conclude with verses 13 through 19, compassion for those in the marketplace with another side measure, a side measure of judgment for those who oppressed you as you traveled from Egypt. Okay. Let me repeat the breakdown again. Uh, 24, 1 through 5, then 7 through 9 is one unit. 24, 16 is another unit. 24, 6, 10 through 15, 17 through 22 is yet another unit. And then into chapter 25, more straightforward, 1 through 4, 5 through 12, 13 through 19. There's uh, clear as mud. Good. That's the, way I, that's the way I roll as a teacher. All right. So we go to Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 5, and 7 through 9. Compassion for those in dire circumstances like divorce, human trafficking, and leprous diseases. I think verse 1 alerts us that there's an unusual situation here. Having discovered something wrong with her, the New Living says, the ESV says, some indecency in her. We're not quite sure what this really means. What's wrong with her? What indecency? And a lot of commentators wonder if there's some sexual or moral indiscretion that somehow doesn't quite rise to the level of adultery because the penalty for adultery is pretty straightforward, death. Now, by the time we get to the days of Jesus, one school of thought has decided that something wrong with her is anything I don't particularly like. I don't like her cooking. She doesn't wait on me the way I deserve. She's not as pretty as she used to be. Divorce her, put her out on the street. You know, Jesus jumps on the Pharisees pretty hard about this behavior. 
Verses 2 and 3 set up the scenario. The first husband divorces the wife, gives the wife the certificate. She's free to remarry. But if that second husband divorces her, then the first, first husband cannot remarry her. Why? Because she has become ritually unclean with regard to husband one. Defiled is what the text says. And that word has a harsher connotation for us now than I think it did then. This actually protects the women in some ways. At least two ways. One, when she's divorced by the first husband, she has proof, a certificate that shows she's free to remarry which furthers the point for me that this couldn't be adultery. And then two, uh, it keeps her from being what Christopher Wright describes as a maritable, marital football passed back and forth between irresponsible men. No doubt we could say more about that, but we must move on. Verse 5 then sneaks in a protection for newlyweds, we're moving from marriage that's gone south into marriage that's just starting. And the husband cannot be drafted into military service that first year. Good news for the husband and the wife. And then who would kidnap somebody and either imprison him for slavery for themselves or sell them to be slaves for others for what the market will bear? Apparently enough people to warrant an injunction in verse 7. With a strict penalty, the kidnapper must die so you can purge the evil from among you. Anybody think of Joseph here? If, if you don't, you need to. And so right now, think Joseph. Okay, that's done. Now, regrettably, this pattern continues today, doesn't it? Uh, more than 27 million people are trafficked in human trafficking as slaves, according to the State Department website. Houston, which is not one of our major accomplishments, is a major hub, according to one source, the number one hub in the country uh, for human trafficking. Yeah. So this hasn't gone away, has it? Now we jump to what seems to be a consistent concern among the people of, of the, the day, not only of the ancient Israelites, but in Jesus' day. What to do with leprous skin diseases? Verses 8 and 9. Now if you're familiar with the term deferred maintenance, then uh, you're familiar with what's being called for here. Don't wait. Don't try to put it off. It never gets better or easier than when you defer dealing with the problem. Just like you got that leak, you need to take care of it now. Don't put it off. Don't wait for later. Go to the priests. Do what they tell you. Remember your history, says the text, like with Miriam as you were coming from Egypt. Then quickly, verse 16 in chapter 24, compassion and legal relationships between parents and children. You know, theologically, emotionally, psychologically, it's often true that the sins of the parents are visited upon the children. Uh, patterns of life uh, that move and flow from one generation to the next, and sometimes it's only with a concerted effort, with the help of many, many people can one break free from these dysfunctions? But most commentators don't think this verse is talking about that. Most commentators hold that this verse is talking about legal liability. And ancient legal codes, such as the laws of Hammurabi, argue that you can punish children, I mean parents, for the sins of children, and vice versa. For example, if a builder constructs a house that collapses and kills the homeowner's son, then the builder's son is put to death. But Deuteronomy argues you can't do that. You can't punish the son for the misdeeds of the father or kill the mother for the misdeeds of the daughter. 
that is neither fair nor compassionate. And then we get to what chapter 24 is largely concerned about in verses 6, 10 through 15, 17 through 22, compassion for the working poor, the foreigners, the orphans, the widows. Verse 6 says what ought to be common sense for collateral, for a loan. If you require a poor miller to give his millstone to you, then you're just wrong. And why wouldn't you see that? You're threatening their very lives, not just their employment, because they use that to make their food to eat. Who would think that's okay? The implied answer, people who want money more than compassion for their fellow human beings. Verses 10 through 13 talk about loans again, more about collateral. You don't get to invade their privacy to pick something for your collateral. Go in their house and go, I like this, this will work. You'll get it back when you've paid me off. You also don't get to take their cloak, their garment. That's what they wear during the day and sleep on, their bedding at night. We're really talking about the destitute here. It, sometimes it's the only thing they may possess. You don't get to take that and keep that for the duration. For anything longer than daylight hours, you return it to them as sunset comes. In the end of verse 13, notes just how important God thinks this is. The Lord your God will count you as righteous. And then 14 and 15, yet again, you don't take advantage of the working poor, short-term day laborers. Here's a key distinction. doesn't matter whether they're Israelites or foreigners. You don't take advantage of them. And you provide daily pay so they can have daily food. Again, verse 15, if you don't, they might cry out to the Lord against you and it would be counted as sin. In verses 17 and 22 through 22 are unified by a recurring phrase, something good Bible students notice, foreigners, orphans, widows. It may use a little different terminology in your translation, but that recurs throughout this section. You don't accept a widow's garment as collateral because she's among the more, most destitute in Israel. You don't go back after you've worked through your fields to harvest, whether it's grain or olives or grapes, to get what you missed because that's there to take care of the people who don't have fields to go to and they have to glean from your field. Again, verses 18 and 22, we're told how important God thinks this is. You were slaves in Egypt, the text says, and you remember those days, you ought to remember those days, when you needed assistance far beyond what you could provide for yourself. Now, Christopher Wright says the following about how all of this comes together. Community care is in itself dependent upon corporate awareness of the grace of God. Twice Israel is reminded of the Exodus and its proof of God's generosity to Israel at its time of utter need. When Israel forgot its history, it forgot its poor. The prophets have to remind them of both. And it's not surprising, Wright goes on, in modern Western culture, which has systematically been squeezing the biblical God out of its definition of reality and truth, there is a corresponding resurgence of callousness toward the vulnerable, end of quote. Deuteronomy 24, you see, wants us to remember compassion and to share the grace that we've received. Then we get into chapter 25, verses 1 through 4. Compassion for those undergoing punishments mandated by legal proceedings, as well as the compassionate treatment of working animals. You know, ancient law had little, if any, provision for imprisonment. It was more you paid some form of restitution, you gave some form of compensation, you entered some form of indentured servitude. But there were times when corporal punishment was decided the best thing to do, the result of a legally procured verdict. Verses 1 through 3 tell us how that's done. Note the presence of a judge to keep things from degenerating into abuse. There must be a trial. There must be a proper proportion of lashes, often with the rod, not a whip, in the presence of the judge so that families or other aggrieved persons do not take over and it uh, 
becomes a time when emotions rule. And there is a limit on how many lashes can be administered to maintain the dignity of the one being punished. Now that sounds so harsh to us, but it's actually a way to provide punishment for crimes committed without descending into vengeance. And then the little verse about the ox grazing as treading out the grain, common sense really, uh, but it's an extension of the gleaning rites we've read about in chapter 24, even to working animals. And this gets mentioned twice in the New Testament. Isn't that amazing? The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 and in 2 Timothy 5. Paul's argument, if God is this concerned about animals, then how much more concerned is he about people and in particular, people who are spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. They need to be cared for. Then, uh, verses 5 through 12, I'm sure everyone's favorite set of verses, compassion for families who, because of death, are unable to continue the family line and how to remedy that. This arrangement of furthering things seems to have little relevance for us today, we think, but it was deeply important to the Israelites and it was a mechanism to provide for the widow of a brother and to continue the name of that deceased brother on through the generations. The widow becomes the wife of the brother-in-law and is protected and provided for by this newly established relationship. Now, why would brothers-in-law not do this? Well, often it was financial. You already have children, and now you're going to introduce another child into the mix who will receive some of the estate. You know, that's why the person at the end of the book of Ruth, that's why that person uh, tells Boaz, I, I don't want the land because of the obligation with Ruth. And so Boaz is a kinsman redeemer, and Boaz redeems the the family, but he's not the closest one, and so they have to go through this scenario where Boaz becomes publicly identified as the proper kinsman redeemer for Ruth. And this is also why you have the occasion of shaming the reluctant brother in law in verses 7 through 10 the counsel by the town elders, the, the pulling off of the sandal, even the spitting in the face. Sometimes legal prescriptions are less effective than communal shame. And in a shame and honor culture, that's often how it goes. The widow is then freed to marry outside the family. And it's this concern with furthering the family line that verses 11 and 12 are about, at least by a majority report. There are some minority reports that argue differently. Uh, apparently, some things are out of bounds in a fight. Again, strange to us, but it makes sense in an agrarian culture with strong codes of honor in the family. And then verses 13 through 19, as we bring it home, as we land the plane, compassion for those in the marketplace with a side measure of those who oppressed you in e on your way from Egypt. Concerned about bearing false witness? Ten Commandments certainly are. And so make sure that one way of not bearing false witness is that you have proper scales, weights, and measures. That you're not having one set for the people you're trying to dupe and another set that, that uh, is correct. Even in commerce, you see fairness and justice and compassion are needed. You don't try to rip anyone off. And verse 16 summarizes, all who cheat with dishonest weights and measures are detestable to the Lord your God. That's the New Living rendering. And this mention of what is apparently detestable before God prompts a sidebar comment, I think, about the Amalekites and what they did to the Israelites on the journey from Egypt. They attacked them at their most vulnerable spot as they were wiped out. And they especially focused on the people straggling behind. Who are the people straggling behind? Well, the elderly, the very young, 
the sick, pregnant women, the defenseless. And so to attack the defenseless is a sign of human depravity. I like what Christopher Wright says here. It's my last Christopher, Christopher Wright reference. Quote, it's interesting here as in Amos 1 and 2 that non-covenant nations are still assumed to be morally accountable to God for fundamental norms of human behavior. The Amalekites are to be judged then not just because they had been anti-Israel but because they had been anti-human by disregarding basic human obligations instilled by the Creator God. They don't have to know God even to know some of the basic stuff. What C.S. Lewis would call the law, the moral law, the Tao. I had to get in a C.S. Lewis reference, those of you who know me. Mission accomplished. Well, that's about it, I think. Now let's end with prayer, and you can go to your groups and have fun discussing the pertinent parts of chapters 24 and 25. Oh Lord, bless our study and bless our reflection upon what we've studied. Give us the presence of your Holy Spirit as we do so. This we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you and God bless.